So today we're here with, um, I'm here with uh, Dr. Heather Buker and uh, Heather looks after uh, Technology Office worldwide uh, as Chief Technology Officer based in the States. Um, well, I've had the, uh, the pleasure and opportunity to work with Heather for, I don't know, probably going on about six months uh, now and, and thought it would be great to just have a bit of a chat, fireside chat as we, as we call it. Uh, to explore a bit about, um, you know, life, the universe and, and kind of what gets us going. Uh, so anyway, welcome, um, Heather. Thanks for thanks for joining me today. Yeah, always a pleasure. Yeah, cool. So um, I don't know, I think I think with these sorts of things, it's really interesting to, you know, get a bit of understanding of, of, of your life and, and story. I don't know where you want to start, but maybe, you know, pick 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 some point, you know, little girl, big girl. Yeah. Uh, you know, wherever, I don't know. Somewhere in that yeah. journey, and uh, love to hear just sort of, you know, a bit about your story and 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 how you've got to this this point, and um, yeah, we'll take it from there. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, once upon a time, <laughs> I was uh, a young young girl in uh, East Tennessee, Southeast Tennessee, um, and I actually started in technology in middle school, which uh, in the U.S. is like grades six through eight. Mm -hmm. And I joined an organization called Technology Students Student Association, TSA or some such. And that's where I started learning um, engineering. I was actually afforded the opportunity, even in my public school system, to do a STEM track. And so I started down that path and learned that I really liked computers, especially. Um, I started competing in these TSA competitions. Oh, wow. <laughs> Like, yeah, ultra nerd alert. That was me growing up. Um, <laughs> but but I, I did play basketball my entire life through college. So I was a well-balanced wow. nerd jock combo, if you will. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's how I got my start. And then uh, I knew from then on that I wanted to go to engineering school. And so that took me to a private engineering school um, in Indiana, where I got a computer engineering degree with a minor in computer science. Uh, which led to an engineering management degree because I quickly learned that I didn't want to be a developer. Um, I liked the the people interaction and solving the problem and letting somebody else go um, implement it, basically. Uh, so then uh, most recently, I got my doctorate in cyber and information assurance. So yeah, I started as a consultant after college and that yeah. was a wild ride, um, especially yeah. as a really young 20 something traveling on somebody else's dime to all of these yeah. client sites all over the US. Really cool experience. Um, from there, I did a lot of product management stuff um, and then moved over to Six Clicks, worked for a lot of our competitors, either as an implementer or on the team directly um, yeah. before coming over. So yeah, that's like the really short yeah, 30 second short. elevator speech of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm curious, like something just ticked in my head when you said, um, what was it, the TPSA? The TSA. TSA. Yeah. And yeah. you talked about like getting into engineering. What was it? Was it engineering? Like when I think about engineering, I think about bridges or cars or, you yeah. know, like civil or maybe I mean, trains. maybe electrical. Yeah. But, yeah. Was it was it that or and then you sort of pivoted over to computer science to some extent, but was it initially like bridges and planes and, you know, it, it, you, know you know, it kind of was um, in okay. particular. So I, I competed in a couple different areas with TSA, both locally and at um, the state level yeah. um, for the state of Tennessee. And I competed actually in um, speech. So oh. giving speeches on technology topics um, and because I was one of those crazy people that actually enjoyed public speaking. So I yeah. did speech competitions. Um, I also did a um, like problem solving competition and that's it's pretty open ended, but that's kind of mm. how the competition was designed to be. Mm. And in those like one one of them was uh, building a bridge with only the materials you were given. Yeah. It had to withstand yeah. a certain amount of weight. You know, all of those really typical like yeah. grade school age, getting your hands dirty in the STEM world kind of stuff. Um, but I also started getting into um, coding competitions. Mm. And so I did a little bit of that in middle school and high school as well, which led me down the computer science path. 
Um, and that's how I found computer engineering was kind of the the mold between the two, um, mm -hmm. kind of meeting hardware and software together. And that's kind of what led me to decide to go down um, that path as opposed to sort of the um, hard, stringent yeah. engineering or computer science. Yeah. I really wanted to blend those together. Yeah. And this, you know, the public speaking bit's interesting. Did you find that that was like, because um, it's a it's a rare skill. I mean, you know, to be frank, it's 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 probably exactly why you're doing what you're doing. But yeah. you know, now I mean, you, and you and you're brilliant at it. But um, is is it something that you feel, you know, there's just a natural ability, or is it something that you trained or learned oh, to no. be able to take a whole heap of complex engineering, you know, computer science principles, and in your mind, you're like you you can you know what I call kind of go up and go down yeah. right like you can go into the weeds but then you need to communicate to a broader audience so you need to simplify that messaging and use analogies or whatever but did you find that that came really naturally or was there something that you pushed to learn or develop that skill I think it's both um right. I think I I definitely had a knack for articulation yeah and articulating solutions to problems or better articulating what what problem I was trying to solve. But I think um, when you talk about being able to speak in front of others or just being comfortable in that space, I think that's very much so just a natural component. For me, uh, my dad was extremely friendly or just open to communicating with anyone and everyone. And he had always been like that my entire life, you know, no strangers were met, et cetera. So I think my um, my ability to just kind of go with the flow in yeah. communications and not I, do, I don't really get the nerves of public speaking. Um, I don't have to imagine anyone sitting in their yeah. underwear in the audience or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, I think that came inherently, but I think understanding how to speak to different audiences is a learned technique. Yeah. Um, because then you have to start considering how other people think and that's mm. not something that you're just born with that's mm. a certainly a learned skill from my perspective and once you understand their perspectives and how they're processing the information you can better tailor your responses to them yeah. um so i think that's kind of the learned aspect of that skill yeah. but yeah certainly you can't just take any old body and stick them on a stage and yeah and hope for the best it's there's a there's a you know, a finesse to it and a some learned skill and some inherent, you know, it's yeah. just how that works. Yeah. And I think that I think that sort of when you're looking at the audience, you need this sort of empathy. You need to sort of try and appreciate what the people that you're talking to may or may not understand and get that balance between, you know, you know what it's like when you're you know, you're listening to something and it's overly simplistic, right? And you're wanting lots more detail or conversely yeah it's you know it's super detailed and and technical and you you don't even understand the fundamentals so getting yeah. that you know getting that balance right is kind of a bit of a trick so what did you um like your phd's were super impressive and i and i say that because you know my family uh both my parents were academics and both pay oh, like i'm the only person in the family without a phd as it happens so you know i feel i've always been sort of a bit you know, scratching around the edges on that one. So, you know, kudos on that. But what did you, what was the motivation there? Was it sort of like wanting to climb the tallest mountain? I guess, you know, PhDs are certainly recognised and for good reasons that, you know, they're, they're a high order of thinking and problem solving and research. Mm -hmm. or, or was it that there was something you really wanted to, probably a combination of both of these things, you know, really wanted to understand at a level of depth that you didn't like. What was the, yeah, what was the motivation behind? Yeah, the... well, um, there are several folds to this one. So uh, once upon a time when I said I was going to engineering school, I basically told myself at that point I wasn't going to stop until I couldn't go any further. Yeah. Um, at that time, I don't know that I really knew what that meant. Obviously, I knew it meant some kind of terminal degree, but I had no idea you know, in what discipline it would be or anything like that. I just knew that I wanted to accomplish it. Mm. And I'm a very outcome driven person. Mm. Um, I'm a set a goal and go get it kind of person. So as soon as I said that, you know, 
I'm like, okay, well, at some point in my life, I'm going to yeah. do that. So that's kind of motivation number one. Motivation number two is um, my husband was gone for um, quite some time deployed and uh, I got bored and I don't handle being bored right. well. <laughs> so that was sort of the catalyst that kicked off um, the whole, you know, last degree. Um, but yeah, it's, it was more of, I, I have to keep going until I can't go anymore. I have mm. to find um, where the ceiling is if there is one. But mm. ultimately, you know, circumstances just pushed me to, you know, there's no better time than the present. Mm. Mm. That's inspiring. I get it. Like you, you know, you keep 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 scratching and scratching and scratching until you feel yeah. as if, like you've hit concrete, right? So, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. It's yeah. a blessing and a curse, right? I mean, you can really. Um, you know, you can be really successful and you can accomplish all of these things or you can um, your mindset can be a bit shifted because, you know, some things aren't obtainable or maybe you didn't obtain them in the same time frame that you originally set out to do because of outlier circumstances. Um, and, you know, it's a it's a delicate balance between setting those goals and going to achieve them, but also understanding that life happens and mm. not letting that impact your you know, mm. how successful you allow yourself to feel, right, after yeah. you accomplish said goal. Yeah. And I think it's ultimately it plays into confidence, right? Like when you've done all of that, you're in a really good spot to communicate even more effectively, you know, yeah. like go into meetings just like a little bit, you know, just with that confidence. And it's all, you know, a lot of it's about confidence business, right? You've got to yep. feel as if you're the master of your domain or, um, you know, whether you are or not, part of the trick is just, you know, getting in the right headspace. So, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. For me, um, I think it's also about competition. Okay. And I'm I'm a huge competitor. Everything's a competition for me. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's great and also a character flaw. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's one of those things like, yep, I did this. You know, there's only a certain uh, amount of people in the world or in our population that have done that. You know, there's like a this certain frankly arrogance probably mm. that comes with that just to feel mm. like you accomplish something that not everybody does mm. um but yeah i think being a basketball player my whole life really drove home the need for competition yeah. and not being an athlete anymore is i have to find competition elsewhere so so you must be tall like this is this is i'm this not is... tall <laughs> I'm you're not tall, tall right no, I was a point guard. So okay. I was all, I was a guard my whole life. I'm only five six. So I'm right. not I am not tall. I'm not even tall. Like I'm short for a point guard in yeah. collegiate sports. So yeah. Yeah. But it's the kind of position where, yeah, you you know, just the just the aggression of sort of trying to trying to do that thing is probably most important. Yeah, and I will. And as a point guard, you're kind of the orchestrator. Yeah. So there's a level of like basketball IQ. We always called it that you had to have, and being yeah. fluid and thinking on the fly and being the decision maker on the court, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, you can really make you can make up for your height with Do you the higher. Still play? Uh, so before we moved to uh, the middle of nowhere, and sorry, you're probably hearing Basil back there uh, throwing yeah, the stick around. But um, before we moved out here, I played in a co-ed league for quite some time after college. But I haven't played um, in a league like that in a while. So. Yeah, yeah. And tell, tell me, I mean, it's like, it's intriguing and I love it. Tell me about this background. Like, where are you? Yeah. Like, I know you've, <laughs> yeah. you've come back from a road trip. Tell me about that. Yeah, so I'm sitting on the front porch of my house. Um, this is my house. Mm -hmm. A rocking chair. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a canned image. Like it's. Yeah. So, no. So this is my home. Yeah. Um. And you might have seen my dog Basil running yeah. around in the background. My German Shepherd puppy. Um. Yeah. So we live out in no man's land in northwest Montana. Um. In yeah. a small unincorporated town on a twenty acre homestead. Hmm. So. Yeah. That's what you're. That's what you're seeing in the background is the side wow. of my house. And it's good that you can get, I mean, I know this sounds like a really sort of dumb thing to say in 2022, but you've obviously got good telecommunications infrastructure. Yeah. So it's actually not a dumb thing to say because I live, right. I live amongst people who are completely off the grid. Um, you know, ah, most of the choice. houses. Yes. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. come here to, you know, get lost, to escape right. and, you know, completely be off the grid. But we get fiber. 
connection out here, but you know, it's because in the States, in these smaller towns, like we, our town has about 450, 500 people in it. Um, because we didn't have any infrastructure built before, when people started requesting things like internet access, et cetera, um, it was, you know, after the ages of fiber. So it's just as easy to lay fiber as it is any other yeah. kind of cable, right? So we just got lucky and uh, yeah. were able to be really it's, remote and have good telecoms. And that was that was obviously part of your criteria when you picked uh, Yeah, it had to be. Like yeah. you couldn't have, you couldn't have, you no. couldn't have do, right? Like, no, I still got to, I still got to work. I wish I could be a full-time homesteader, but that's just not the cards <laughs> right now. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but no, I'm just, you know, glad and blessed that I can at least work from home. Um, you know, like we, we have good telecoms here, but we actually don't have cell phone signal for about an oh, hour no. radius of our home. So we have to use Wi-Fi calling and all of that. Oh. Um, yeah, that so if our okay? power goes out, we're truly off grid for quite some time. Yeah, so there's no, so that's probably, that's the downside, right? If you, if the power goes out, you've got no Wi-Fi, which means no calls. Yeah, so you jump in the car. So we have, yeah, well, we have a generator. So everyone around here, if they're on the grid, like most all of us have backup generators um, or power blocks or some such, so we can at least get some communication out. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, it, and it's funny, anytime I talk to people about this, they, they're like, oh, you need Wi-Fi. You can't just exist without Wi-Fi. And I'm like, well, it's not that I need, I want to, you know, surf the internet. It's yeah. that literally is our communication line. So yeah. if we have an emergency or something bad happens and we mm. don't have power, we don't have, our landline doesn't work, right? Yeah. Um, and we have to have some means of communicating to the outside world in emergency circumstances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our, it, it's it's funny because it's ironic and I get it in, you know, 2022, the age of technology. But as soon as our power goes out, the first thing we do is plug our, excuse me, plug our Wi-Fi into our power block so that we can yeah. get it back up and running. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's like, like the lights can wait, everything yeah, else can wait, yeah. get the Wi-Fi back on. Yeah, it's Mas Maslow's hierarchy of needs has been like something new's been in. So, you know, Wi Fi is like absolutely in it. You know, yeah, the yeah. grizzly bear comes, you need to know, <laughs> you need to know that you can, you can call for help. So, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I get that. And what's, um, so, you know, you did, you did your pay a chance. Like, it's been awesome working with you, obviously, at Six Clicks. And, you know, we're, we're obviously going through this sort of incredibly exciting time. I don't know about you, but I, I just wake up every day and I'm like, Wow, I just can't believe it. Like I'm like, this is yeah. this, this is awesome fun. But um, what do you think? What what do you think you'll be doing in in you know five years, ten years time? Like, what's the what you know? Have you given that? Do you give that thought ever, or do you sort of more like roll with roll with it? Or yeah. Oh, I am. I do not roll with things very well. So I am. I am very much a <laughs> a planner, at least to a degree. Uh, again, like. I'm all about goal setting and setting lofty goals and seeing how close I can get to them or, um, you know, anything like that. So if you ask me 10 years from now, my goal is actually to be out of the technology space yeah. and being a full-time homesteader. That's yeah. like the, the epitome of where my passion it's lies. Yeah. Yeah. That's the dream. And if you told me that I get, I get that in 10 years time, I'm like, heck Yeah. Let's Happy do it. Let's bang these yeah. 10 years out. Right. Yeah. Um, but I also, it's interesting. I love technology and I love being in this space because we solve these really, really complex problems. Yeah. And that's what my brain enjoys doing. Yeah. Um, so in five years time, I'm probably going to be sitting somewhere like this, yeah. maybe still talking to you in another fireside yeah. chat, uh, <laughs> talking about how incredible our six click success, success has been. Um, but, you know, in, in 10 years, I hope that I'm I'm living my other dream, right? Yeah. And um, I love homesteading so much because it presents really complex problems that we have to find solutions for. Yeah. You know, dealing with weather, dealing with wildlife, um, yeah. you know, food stock, all this sort of thing. It's just a different type of problem, mm. but it provides the same satisfaction to solve. Um, mm. So I'm probably still yeah, going to be sitting that. here in five years, but... But ten years may be a different story. We'll see. Yeah. No, I think I think you're right. I mean, I I I've I've always been, you know, technology a bit like you, you know, from from a really early age, you know, yeah. introduced to technology. Luckily, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, 
back back then, I guess, you know, in the in the early nineties or late eighties, like technology from from in in the world wasn't really particularly prolific. But you know, I had the opportunity to get exposure, and then of course that you know sets up your career really well. And you know, not too many people know it, but you know, I've always thought that there's a so there's a there's a part of my heart that's always going to be you know associated yeah. with technology. But like my mission or where my head goes might be in plenty of other areas. A bit like, you know, a bit like what you're talking about. You know, you can apply that same um, passion, but just in a different context, right? And yeah, in your exactly. case, it's, um, what did you call a homesteading? It's not really a term that we we in Australia. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually. I may be upsetting some people by using the word homesteading Explain because that. I also said that I, I am on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> those two things, uh, being on grid and being a homesteader, that's kind of an oxymoron. Right. But um, homesteading is like um, self-living. So right. uh, self-sustainable. Right. Yeah, very sustainable. Like I said, generally you're off grid, um, you know, you're on a well system and you're, you um, harvesting your own food whether it be vegetables whether it be meat everything in between um and generally just making your property your living right everything comes from the earth and you give back to the earth um in this very self-sustainable capacity so um the the actual people who are actually homesteaders I, we can't claim to be homesteaders because we're right. we're on grid and we we um still have conveniences but true homesteaders um don't have all of that but they're you know thriving with nature right mm. so um and what's the yeah. biggest what, what's ultimately the biggest challenge like if you were if you were to go off grid like let's assume you weren't doing what you're doing now like what's the, as a homesteader, like what's the, I'm sure there's plenty of things that you can solve reasonably easily, right? Mm. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe like if you find a good water source and you manage to get that in and it's clean and reusable, then, you know, that's all cool. But like what's the, what's the bit where you've got to be very resourceful or clever or like what's the hardest bit of homesteading to get right ultimately? Um. I would say um, fighting with the unknown. Right. Um, you know, you're you're fighting weather, you're fighting, you know, literal wildlife. Um, yeah. You're um, having to manage, you know, this is what we need through the winter. If you don't have a greenhouse and can't grow in the winter, making sure that you're prepared for all of these unknowns. Um, right. I've never been a proper homesteader, but um, we do live an hour and a half from town um, yeah. where town equals somewhere we can get food Stop. and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's close. <laughs> um, and just trying to figure out, trying to think about what you don't know, trying to think, OK, um, if, if we literally get snowed in, which is not a possibility, it's going to happen. Right. You know, what do we need to make sure that we can make it until we can get back out again? You know, from yeah. a food perspective, what if we lose power having backup energy sources? Um, you know, if because if we lose power, we also don't have running water. So making yeah. sure that we have a well tap so that we can still get fresh water, all that kind of stuff. Mm. It's just kind of um, having to predict what Mother Nature is going to do to you. Yeah. Right. And. And, and you don't like, want to mess with that. Like it's no, it's, yeah. no. <laughs> you don't no, want to get into guy, an arm wrestle with it, right? Yeah, you know, just thinking yeah. it's mm. yeah. And that's why it's just as important from my perspective to give back as much as we're taking. Yeah. So being self sustainable is to me really living with the land, not on the land. So being respectful of all of the resources that we have in our backyard. You know, um, it's kind of the cut down a tree, plant a tree concept, yeah. but maybe not as literal. Um, but just being good to the land that's providing to us mm. is really important. So. Mm. And it's such an important thing. How much of it's driven? Sorry, I, I just love this topic. How much is it driven in your mind around climate change? Like, as in, is that a big motivator or is it more just a lifestyle general mission? Do you know what I mean? Like, what's. Yeah. The, for for me, it's more of a lifestyle choice yeah. and a respect. Um, and if that means that there's a, a positive impact on things like then climate good. change, 
that's that's like an added bonus for me. Not that I don't care about climate change. It's just that I feel some things are inevitable to happen, right? When we induce and when we introduce industrial technologies, et cetera, like we're just kind of reaping what we sow. Mm. Um, but for me, it's more of a lifestyle choice and a respect for all that this land has to give us. Mm. Um, all that the animals have to give us when we hunt and things like that. Like it's just, you yeah. know, you're providing for us so much that we owe everything back to you to make sure you stay beautiful and clean and, you know, just respected. Yeah. 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 No, it's really, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting theme. Um, yeah, let's, let's change. Like I, you know, we talked about a bit about sort of, you know, what we're doing from a, from a business point of view and, you know, like where everything's going, like what's, What's the stuff that I, I guess excites you most at the moment professionally? Like, what do you what do you feel? Um, yeah, what's 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 igniting that sort of wake up in the morning, let's go thing? Yeah, for you? we we are making crazy progress in the global markets. Mm. I mean, I've been here seven months now. Is it seven? Back. It is seven. Does, yeah, does I almost Michelle corrected started, you earlier, but yeah, it's seven. Yeah, July. Michelle started and then you came like weeks later or something. And that was me. We started like... on the same day. Oh, did you? Yeah, I could... okay. That's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It was seven months ago. That's like, like I, eternity yeah. in our minds yeah. <laughs> in startup language. So, no, um, I think it's just been, you know, I knew when I started, I was really excited about this opportunity because of everything at Six Clicks that we're doing differently or that at yeah. that time you guys were doing differently. And, um, I had had so much experience in the market with some of our competitors and things like that, that it was really, frankly, hard to pique my interest anymore. Yeah. Right. It was just the same Joe Schmo doing the same workflows, the same yeah. things over and over again. But then um, Michelle came to me about the opportunity at Six Clicks and it was just all different. So yeah. I'm like, oh, this is really interesting, but it's also too good to be true. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. of course, it's, I had, I had to rubbish. enter it. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, I had to enter this, you know, with an open mind, but also a cautious one, mm. to be frank. Mm. And I've never been more wrong to be cautious mm. in my life. And that's mm. what I've learned over the past seven months. And just to take a look back at where we started then to where we are now, Yeah, that that's plenty enough to get me excited. Um, I mean, just in the U.S. market alone, but what things we're doing globally and our growth has been absolutely exponential uh, that I can't even fathom being in your shoes mm. as a founder mm. in the garage, conceptualizing this thing yeah. called six clicks. And then yeah. to see where we are now, you know, three, not even three years later. Yeah. Um, so it's for me that that kind of growth and that kind of innovation that we bring to the table every single day is enough for me to get up and not need a second cup of coffee. Yeah. Right. So I'm really excited to see where, where we are when we can have this conversation again in December yeah. this year, you know, what we can do in a year is just, it's going to be it's out amazing. of control. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I yeah. think it's, I think it's just getting, it's getting faster, you know, it's that classic snowball thing, you know, speaking of snow in your neck of the woods. You yeah. know, uh, I dream of that one day. I mean, I don't, you know, there's never any snow here. You've got to go Coming to Coming out to Montana, Memphis. we got plenty. You can even yeah, take this, some this, back home with you if you want. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I think, I think when you and Michelle started, there was, you know, there was so many things that I think we'd sort of laid some foundations for, but also perspectives that we just didn't see fully, you know, like the hub and spoke stuff and, you know, just opportunities that we'd seen, but not fully. And, you know, having that fresh pair of eyes and, you know, perspective and all the experience that you guys have had and, and bought, um, I think is just, is just catapulted our business to, to another level. It is a bit, you know, as a founder, like I look back, I chatted to, I actually spoke, spoke to Louis last night and, um, you know, we were just reminiscing about a couple of things, but, you know, you, it's a scary process because you lay these bets on what you think the market needs and as much research and experience as you've got, you've still ultimately got to place a bet and, right. you know, you can't be all things to all people. You've got to be, you know, move the, try to move the industry forward or at least, you know, do something that's that's new. 
Um, but to see it all sort of play out as it has, um, at least, you know, well, I mean, we've made thousands of mistakes. You know, Louis right. keeps telling me the amount of the amount of stuff that we built that never got used or was, you know, mothballed or, you know, yeah. stuff that we just got wrong. Um, but ultimately we're here and it, yeah, it's 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 a it's an awesome time. Um, All you gotta do is think about the light bulb, right? Yeah. Found a bunch of ways not to on how to not yeah, what do is it. it. Thousands of times, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's something that that really makes us unique in the market because I think, you know, the players that we're competing with, especially here in the states. I know I keep talking about the states, but the yeah. problem is global. But the competitors that we have, they're solving old issues with old solutions. And then they're trying to solve new problems with these old solutions. Yeah. And there's not a ton of innovation. There's not a lot of risk takers. Mm. You know, they're all doing the same thing with a different UI. Mm. And we've taken that and completely uplifted it. Um, we offer, you know, the hub and spoke architecture that they can't to solve yeah. for huge issues. Um, I remember one of the very first conversations Michelle and I had when she she's like, yeah, there's the six clicks company out of Melbourne. And I'm like, hang on. <laughs> a company out of where doing what um but she's like no you have to see it heather you have to get into a trial and you have to look at it yeah um it's really cool and they have this multi-tenancy and yeah. i'm like no they don't they yeah. don't have it. you know we all we all have multi-tenancy but you know we're just we're not actually doing it and then i remember the first time i actually got a walkthrough of the hub and what we know now is our hub and spoke i'm like holy cow yeah you just solved the world's grc problems like there are so many people that need this so many organizations that fit this model like i can't they they can't sell to just partners they got to bring this into the enterprise yeah. space and all these large organizations like there's such a market um and now, you know, seven months later, and we've sold these enterprise deals using that architecture. It's just like, it's it's really cool to just yeah. be a part of that small little piece of innovation. Well, you know, you you you, you know, you you got to put your fingerprints all over whatever you do, and you know, that's certainly that that expansion in the enterprise, the the way in which we've sort of pivoted that thing. Absolutely, that's that's with with you, you and Mish, you know, to see that opportunity and. And really make it come alive, and in, in certainly in the US. But you know, that's our growth agenda. Is, is you know, I mean, Australia is a great place. I live here, but you know, the US is twenty times bigger, or ten or twenty or whatever. You know, obviously, as a global software business, that's yeah. that's where we see the biggest growth. That's where we want to invest. But yeah, that's awesome. I think this is going to be a really cool conversation to have in six, seven. We eight, should nine, we should book the date. We should book yeah. the fireside chat number two. Yeah, yeah, that'll be that'll be exciting. So we can look back on this and laugh at, you know, everything that we talked about were great because we've had so many other great things happened since then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, this is just the beginning. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. I I think this is. I mean, this has been a great conversation. I I mean, it, it's certainly the highlight of my day, if not the week, if not the month. So, um, yeah, I'm just smiling. I'm smiling ear to ear. It's really good to connect with you and and have this I conversation. Guess. I'm going to ask you one last question, just just sure. because, you know, it's 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 so important, and that is, what's the kindest thing that someone's ever done for you? Oh, man. Well, I um, I don't know if this is the, this is one of the kindest things that anyone's yeah. ever done for me. Um, recently, I went through a tough time with my family and lost my father, and so I've had an outpour of support from tons and tons of individuals. I mean, it's hard to come up with, you know, just the one. But actually, because you can see it in my purview, I'm going to talk about it. There's a rocking chair here. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. That has a little plaque on it that is a memorial chair for my dad that my old college teammates had sent. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really special um, because my dad was obsessed with the mountains and nature and all of this sort of thing. And I am now privileged and blessed to have the opportunity to live amongst them. And he never, he was never able to come here. Um, my husband and I have only been here uh, for a few months now, but he was never able to make the trip for one reason or another. And then he, he passed just in January, but he would have been obsessed with this view. Mm. And my teammates um, maybe don't know that, 
but yeah. um, they know that I'm obsessed with this place and everything. But this rocking chair is really special and definitely one of the kindest gestures that I've ever received. Mm. So that's um, that's I totally get that. Yeah. Uh, so I look forward all the time to coming out and sitting in it and just looking at the view and thinking, you know, dad would love this or, you know, yeah. having a having a beer or a bourbon and yeah. just thinking about how we would be out here chatting about how incredible the mountains were or yeah. whatever. So, and you can sort of, you can see it, you know, it's obviously on your deck, right? So yeah. Yep. That's on the, it's on the porch deck. looking yeah. at the mountains are over yeah. here. Sorry, you guys can't see them, but I promise they're there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm chuffed. I, I think it's been like such a, such a well it's you know honestly it's inspiring to to hear what you've got to say and and understand a little bit about your life and so thank you for sharing that um yeah. and i look forward to talking soon yeah always a pleasure aunt thanks yeah